Uh, I'll start. You can introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm very happy that we could be here and uh, help help facilitate this discussion today. Um, I've been with HDR for about nine years now, um, and uh, we we have been uh, growing our role in transit here and around the country during that time. Uh, obviously, when we merged with SR Beard and Steve and his crew uh, added enormously to our ranks and, and our capabilities in terms of transit planning. So now we uh, we have a much greater reach and depth around the country. We're working in all modes, uh, all over the country. Um, uh, with finally, I guess, are, are doing some work in Hawaii, so we've managed to touch uh, most of the states. Um, I, uh, when I started, we were focusing mostly on heavy rail and then, uh, then more in streetcar over time, but again, now we're working in all modes uh, throughout the country. Um, I was a city commissioner in charge of transportation in Portland for 10 years, which is an elected position, uh, and uh, we have a peculiar form of local government in Portland that's uh, four commissioners and a mayor, and that's the city council, but then each of those elected officials also runs a portfolio of departments. So I ran the transportation department and the planning department, uh, and for a while the parks department in that city structure. So yeah, it's, it, it, you know, don't try this at home, but they, <laughs> they actually, like most things, you know, if you stick with it long enough, you can make it work, and they've had it since 1917, so, uh, so they're going to stick with it as strange and, and awkward as it might seem. Um, so what I thought I'd try to do uh, here in this pre presentation before we jump into discussion together is, is tell you about the streetcar mode, at, you know, what is it, how does it work, uh, what's happened with some of these projects that have been implemented, what's going on around the country in terms of uh, federal funding and planning for these kinds of projects, uh, and then uh, some lessons learned from some of the other projects. You're really having this discussion at a good time right now here in Houston in that, uh, first of all, uh, the, these other cities have tried out this mode. We can learn from them. Secondly, the federal government, after years of being really a closed door to these kinds of projects, has recently provided quite a bit of capital funding for streetcar, <coughs> excuse me, for streetcar projects. Um, and then, you know, third, I think there's some, some changes in how streetcars are functioning. Maybe at first they were mostly economic development ventures led by cities. Now I think they're being viewed, they're still that, very much so but they're also being viewed more as one more modal tool in the kit in terms of regional and local transit planning, and I, I think that's all those are very healthy trends. So, um, switch on my mode here. There we go. Uh, you know, streetcars per se are not a novel idea. Um, every city of any size in the country, uh, Houston and Galveston included, uh, had streetcar systems. Uh, this happens to be a picture of downtown Portland from the early 1900s. Could be a dick picture of downtown anywhere from the early 1900s. And then again, there were just miles and miles. LA had a thousand miles of streetcars. Portland had 200. Um, they were literally uh, the mode uh, of life for urban life in America. You know, one of the things I, I particularly appreciate about these old photos, and this one again is, is not unusual, but, but you know, everybody notices the, maybe the horse-drawn horse, horse -drawn buggy or the first few cars driving down the street and they notice the streetcars, but notice the number of pedestrians on the sidewalk. If you go back and look at these old historic photos, you know, the sidewalks were just crowded with people. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons they were crowded is you can get a lot more people downtown if they don't have to store a car someplace. Uh, and so we're just now with the kind of transit that you enjoy here on your light rail system and that we enjoy in Portland and other places, we're just getting back to that level of, tra of pedestrian traffic after many decades when those streets were empty or nearly so. So I think that what's going on on the sidewalk in these old pictures is at least as instructive as what's going on on the street. Uh, but again, streetcars were everywhere. Um, they. Uh, they got people around town, uh, not just for commuting, but for lots of other trips of daily life. They went to the edge of town, to the fairgrounds, or in Portland's case, to an amusement park. Uh, Washington, D.C. system went up the Potomac River to the Glen Echo Amusement Park that closed in the 60s. 
so they were not just commuter tools. They were circulators. They were um, facilitators of most trips for many people. Uh, and about the same time, all over the country, almost every city uh, said goodbye to their streetcars, uh, maybe not without the ceremony that they had here in Minneapolis on the last day of service where they <laughs> had a little bonfire on the edge of town uh, hosted by the nice people from National City Lines, um, you know, the, the, the consortium of Standard Oil, GM, and Firestone that went around the country buying up streetcars and replacing them with GM buses that ran on Firestone tires and burned Standard Oil. Funny how that worked out. Um, and, uh, and Portland got rid of ours uh, in, in 1954, um, you know, and, and then 20 years later started building light rail. Um, in, the, in the interim, we kept Miss Concrete and Miss Blacktop real busy uh, in, all over the country, including in Portland. I think it'd probably be hard to get a couple of HDAC staffers to dress up like this for a, for a bit of cutting today, but they would do this in the 50s. Uh, yeah, to, uh, Miss Blacktop. Miss Blacktop, yeah. Who wants, who wants that sash? <laughs> So we made the car king, um, you know, all over the country. Uh, again, Portland now uh, likes to think of itself as a model because we've done some things uh, a little earlier than other places. But uh, you know, we were just as car centric in our transportation system 30 years ago as most places. This is a postcard from 1958. You know, the message is be careful crossing the street because you know you, there are not very many pedestrians around and you don't have the right of way. Um, Portland did, uh, like Houston, do great things with light rail and uh, we're one of the early adopters of that transit mode. It's done us a lot of good. Uh, it, it continues to grow its role in our regional transit system. Um, we still have an excellent bus net network. We have our first commuter rail line, uh, but we have really uh, doubled down over the last 20 years on light rail. Uh, we've you know, learned the, the benefits of that kind of transit, not just for moving people, but also for reinforcing the quality of life at street level uh, in our downtown and lots of other places. This, by the way, is not a Photoshop job. This is a real intersection. So <laughs> for the, those of you who deal with T-sub numbers, there really is. This is like Area 51. It really does exist. And, uh, Dave Vizzolo and I were actually working on a transit planning project in, uh, in Providence, and we saw this you know, over out walking around, so we've got to take a picture of that. Nobody will believe it. <laughs> so it's really out there. Um, so streetcars, uh, what we call streetcars in this country, they call trams in Europe. They call all this stuff trams in Europe. But what we mean by streetcars are single vehicles operating generally in traffic, though, of course, in New Orleans, they operate in the neutral ground, uh, operating as an urban circulator. And I'll talk more about what that means. Um, We've used this, we, we really uh, pioneered the, the modern movement for streetcars in Portland when we used the Portland streetcar to redevelop the Pearl District, uh, an old rail yard on the edge of our downtown uh, where we ran the streetcar line through the neighborhood or what would be a neighborhood, laid out a grid of streets and a land use plan and uh, achieved more success than we ever thought we would. Uh, have had about three and a half billion dollars worth of real estate development uh, along the streetcar line uh, since its opening um, 10 years ago this summer. Uh, we're going to come up on our 10th anniversary here in, in a couple of months. So the Portland streetcar project again surprised us with its success. We hoped it would work. It did and helped set off this movement around the country uh, that we're now see uh, a lot of activity in. Uh, the Portland Streetcar has been expanded since from its original line down into what we now call the South Waterfront, again another former industrial area on the shoulders of downtown, a little too far to walk, kind of cut off by the freeways, not a nice place other than the fact that there was a river down there somewhere, um, but you know, many storage warehouses and vacant dirt. It's now growing a new, very high-rise urban neighborhood, actually connected to our medical center with uh, an aerial tram. So uh, another mode introduced to the mix because of the peculiar geography there. Um, but again, the streetcar has been very, very catalytic of this intensity of redevelopment. Nice little mountain in the back. Yeah, back yeah, a little, little, little pretty little mountain out there <laughs> in the background, uh, which we can see for a few weeks each year, yeah. Um, so, as I said, uh, the Portland Streetcar has really set off a movement around the country. There are dozens of cities uh, 
planning, designing, in a few cases actually building now streetcar projects. Uh, HDR is working on a majority of these projects around the country uh, because we really believe this mode does have a place in the mix and we've developed a lot of expertise in planning and designing it. Uh, and, uh, and we're excited to see this progress. Uh, there's a lot of good work being done out there and a lot of uh, excellent collaboration between the agencies involved in making these projects happen. And I'll talk some more about that collaboration because it's pretty important. Uh, as I mentioned, and later earlier, on, if you want to, we can talk more about any of these projects. Yeah, we can. We Charlie's going to go over some of it, but yeah. we can also talk more about what what other places are doing. Yeah, we can dive into the any level of detail you have time for. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the federal government just recently, after we, after we butted our heads against the wall for a really long time, um, has been very helpful with funding for projects. Why do we butt our heads against the, the wall? Because under the conventional FTA process that values travel time savings, there isn't any. These aren't rapid transit. They're slow moving circulators. Uh, they're not going to be any faster than existing bus service. So if travel time savings in the corridor is a metric, is the metric, then um, streetcar projects will never get through the federal process. But uh, through these three rounds of outside of New Start's funding, i.e. Uh, the, uh, the first and second rounds of TIGER uh, and the Urban Circulator Grant, um, we've seen a whole bunch of projects funded. The one and only project that has soldiered all the way through Small Starts is that Portland East Side Loop with a $75 million uh, grant from the FTA. Uh, but that took many years, many millions of dollars, and a shelf full of documents uh, to get to that point. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the more details of this feature. What are we talking about? Again, a, a, a fixed guideway uh, rail system, uh, same gauge, same voltage as light rail. Uh, the difference really isn't the technology, it's how it's used. Um, we're talking about operating in traffic, uh, close to pedestrians, very little separation from what else is going on in the right of way, a relatively modest capacity. You know, you're not going to use this kind of technology on something like the university line here that has to carry 40, 50,000 people a day. You're going to use it on a, a corridor that needs to carry five or 10 or maybe 15,000 people a day. Uh, so there's, what's distinct about the mode is not the technology, but its scale and how it's used in the urban design and streetscape design of the right of way it's operating in. Uh, Portland has a, a robust transit system. As I mentioned, we've, we have a good bus system. We, uh, we have now a pretty extensive light rail system and more to come. Uh, we have a little bit of commuter rail. It's actually a suburb to suburb commuter rail in Washington County. Um, but the streetcar mode, even though we have this infrastructure of the regional transit system, the streetcar mode has a place and it has a role and it has a future, even in a city that's built a lot of other transit. In other words, it's not a choice between are we going to do light rail or streetcar, in my opinion. It's which mode works best where. Um, and so Portland has spent some time thinking about that and has also done a system plan subject to the big, the big regional system plan, which you've just completed here, uh, has, has done some thinking about that and done a streetcar specific system plan for where in the city of Portland we think this initial system might expand over time. Obviously, that's a very big expansion shown in that map, getting, getting somewhere back to the neighborhood of the streetcar system we had and threw away. Um, some some uh, basic principles of streetcars that I think are important to the success of these projects, and that is we generally are, are, are talking about fitting it in to the streetscape, even even the street pattern. If it's a one-way street northbound, then we're likely to be running the streetcar in one direction on that street and not arguing with the traffic engineer about making it a two-way street. Um, keep it simple, get it done, uh, try to avoid moving a lot of utilities, try to avoid uh, stripping parking off the street, but instead use curb extensions and bays of parkings in between the intersections. Uh, get it in, get it done, try to keep construction uh, impacts to a minimum as well. And that philosophy ran through our project in Portland very much and has in other cities as well. 
Uh, the vehicles, we're talking about, again, uh, 65, 70 foot long urban trams, usually with a low floor section in the middle. See if I can make that clip work. Uh, a bridge plate uh, to allow ADA access uh, from the vehicle, so it's real easy for people to roll on and roll off with a wheelchair or a grocery cart or a bicycle. Uh, pedestrians, again, I mentioned earlier, you know, we tend to separate modes, but with streetcar, you don't have to. And this is running right through the plaza at Portland State University. Clueless students looking at their <laughs> iPhones, wandering aimlessly across the tracks. We haven't killed anyone. And that's because the streetcar is operating slowly, the operator is paying attention and ringing the bell. Um, and uh, again, we have to rethink some notions about the separation of uses uh, if we want to exploit all of the opportunities that this circulator mode might have. Uh, the photo in the photos on the left side are from Christchurch, New Zealand, where they've carried some of these principles even farther, running right through the middle of basically a shopping arcade uh, and uh, an outdoor restaurant street um, that's been pedestrianized. So uh, you don't have to stay in the street with a streetcar. Uh, bicycles are a challenge for streetcars because the typical right lane bike lane will get squeezed down to six inches wide when you have the curb extension at the corner for the stop. So you might have to go around behind the stop as you see the, in the lower left-hand corner and the lower right-hand corner. Uh, if the bicycle rider goes down the street, tries to cross the streetcar tracks at a shallow angle, they're likely to stick their tire into the, uh, into the groove and do what the, uh, the sign shop had so much fun illustrating um, <laughs> in the sign. Um, you know, my wife loves me very much and believes in what I do, and she works at Portland State University, and she caught her tire in the tracks and took a tumble and came home kind of frustrated about that. So, you know, this is a, this is a challenge and a problem for, for streetcars. Uh, we've, we've worked on a lot of design solutions uh, and, um, and ways to channel bicycles carefully across and around the tracks. There's been a lot of talk about rubber inserts and other gimmicks to try to make the tracks bike proof, but that doesn't really seem to be feasible in all the different kinds of weather and conditions that our streets have. So it's a challenge. It, it, it requires some care and a lot of customized solutions for this or that intersection of bikes and streetcars. Uh, Cars um, are also a challenge. Uh, they, uh, it, by the way, typically when you're designing a streetcar line, uh, you don't have to worry much about the streetcar's impact on traffic. It's really no greater than a bus, maybe less, because the dwell times of the stops are shorter. But cars' impact on the streetcar can be enormous. If people park badly, um, they either stop you or crunch you. Um, if uh, you, know, you have to have some careful and aggressive enforcement to tell people, uh, no, you can't park there. No, you really have to stay on the right-hand side of that white line. Uh, obviously, this crazy incident in Toronto there in the lower right-hand corner, uh, one accident caused a massive backup of streetcars because <laughs> they can't go around that car. They have to move the car to get the system going again. Um, snow is not an issue down here, but uh, it is in some places. And in Portland, we shut our light rail and streetcar system down for two or three days uh, a couple winters ago because we got a particularly big snowstorm for us, uh, and the ice on the track made it impossible to keep operating. Um, I mentioned the get it done, keep it simple philosophy. This is imp important to the cost of these projects uh, and to their popularity. Uh, getting in uh, and out, not moving a lot of utilities, keeping the street open uh, at least in one lane while you're building the trackway, keeping the sidewalks open, keeping the duration short by doing manageable segments and then moving on to the next one. We were on the Portland Streetcar Project able to keep segment construction under a month, uh, under 30 days for each of those 600 foot segments as we worked our way through the neighborhoods. Uh, that turned out to be pretty important uh, to its uh, popularity and acceptance with the property owners. So let me talk about some of these projects in terms of lessons learned um, and, uh, and maybe some principles that might guide your thoughts about how this might be applied here in the Houston-Galveston area. 
Uh, what did Portland learn? Portland learned that streetcars are a development catalyst, a very powerful development catalyst. They are placemakers at least as much as they are people movers. And we made the place with this streetcar. The Pearl District was, as you can see, an old rail yard, uh, nothing much going on there. And the streetcar totally changed the character and success rate in both time and intensity of what happened in the Pearl District. Um, we also learned in Portland that the trip behavior on streetcars is pretty different. That we've got a lot of people taking short trips. We have, notice the guy in the wheelchair, by the way, easy to get off. Um, uh, short trips on and off, you know, a lot of people standing, as you notice, even when they're, they're standing, they're empty seats, that's because they're only going two or three stops. They're only going three quarters of a mile. Why bother to sit down? Um, so we learned you know, by doing that there's a lot of short urban circulator trips that this mode can serve that aren't really relevant to the bus network or the, rail, the light rail network. Um, Seattle, uh, their, their line opened in 2007. Uh, learned a couple things there. I mean, the Seattle project really pushed the envelope, if you will, on this spectrum between people mover and development catalyst. They were all the way at the development catalyst end of that spectrum. This is a mile and a half long corridor going from the Westlake Center to the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center and on the shores of Lake Union. Mile and a half. It, from a transportation planning standpoint, from a model uh, results standpoint, if we could have found you know, 25 people that would have wanted to go from the Fred Hutch to downtown Seattle, I would have been surprised. Um, it, this is all about development and the ridership that is building on this line is coming because people have moved there, not because there was any pre-existing travel demand whatsoever. So Seattle is an extreme case of these projects generating their own results rather than being responsive to a transportation problem per se. And you can see why this project would have gotten laughed out of the New Start's room at FTA. What do you mean there's no travel demand? Get out of here. Um, but it's been very successful for what they wanted it to do, which was transform South Lake, South Lake Union and start a streetcar system in Seattle. So Amazon.com is completing their corporate headquarters on the line. There are going to be 4,000 employees in those buildings. There are a bunch of new condos. Ridership is building every month as this stuff opens, but it opened with very tepid ridership, about 1,500 people a day. And now it's up to about 4,000, uh, you know, after four years. So uh, it's an extreme case of the development catalyst um, element of these projects. Another thing, lesson learned in Seattle, is you gotta have the private sector with you. These projects are about real estate development and about getting people into the stores and about getting people uh, to activities and destinations and the private sector made this project happen in Seattle, period. The city government helped, um, King County Metro operates it, but the private sector wanted this project done. Uh, as I said, they, they built the first line and then they said, we should expand this into a network. Um, so that system planning eventually caught up with the entrepreneurial venture. But that's, uh, it, it did happen in that order. The first line went in and then they did a system plan. Yeah, worked out, not necessarily planning practice as we know it. Um, Little Rock, some good lessons learned there. You don't have to be a left coast latte drinking fast growth city uh, to make this work. You know, this is a conservative, relatively slow growing uh, central city. Little Rock, and, uh, and they, they have a very successful project that connects Little Rock and North Little Rock, set off a wave of urban development in a city that wasn't seeing any prior to this, uh, and has done a lot for the quality of life in their downtown, and has now been expanded half a mile to the Clinton Library. So um, a great little success story. You don't have to be a mega city um, to build a streetcar. In fact, Kenosha, Wisconsin, an even smaller city, also built a very successful streetcar line. And so they pushed the envelope to how small can you be to actually do this? Um, Atlanta, uh, kind of a cautionary tale. Uh, one of my first projects for HDR was doing the streetcar plan for um, a private group in Atlanta, the Atlanta Streetcar Inc. They wanted to build a streetcar along Peachtree Street to, to complement the regional system 
and to support development in their car. The project got funded by uh, three different business groups along the corridor. Task 12 in our scope of work was pick the first three miles. They wouldn't let us do task 12 because we weren't going to serve all three constituencies. So we ended up with it for several years with a $300 million 12 mile long starter line that was infeasible until they finally got the politics worked out and said, okay, we're going to build the first two and a half miles from the Martin Luther King Center and Ebenezer Baptist Church across the downtown connecting uh, to MARTA uh, right at the city center and then out to the aquarium uh, and the convention center on the other side of downtown. Yeah, finally got to phase one. But it took several years of political massaging to get them to finally do what was our task 12. Um, and they're going out for design build. Yeah, now they're going out for, they got federal money, they're going out for design build. It's going to happen. But um, so a cautionary tale about biting off too much. Uh, Fort Worth, a cautionary tale about having the politics blow up on you. Uh, in this case, the private sector is totally behind the project. In fact, this rendering was generated by the TIF district group on the south side of downtown that have these kind of plans for redevelopment of that neighborhood. Same thing with the Trinity River Vision TIF, TIF district on the north side of Tell downtown. Tell them what a TIF district Oh, tax is. increment financing district. Just to make sure. Yeah, to fund, <laughs> to fund public improvements. And they said, this is the public improvement we want to fund because this will support the plans and dreams that we have for our district. No opposition from residents served by the project, some opposition from conservative voters elsewhere in the city saying, what are you doing, city council, spending money on a toy train downtown when you haven't paved streets in my neighborhood? But the primary problem was one property owner in the downtown uh, decided that they didn't like this project and they were so politically powerful that they rolled the city council and they blew up the project and sent $25 million back to the federal government that they had applied, to, applied for six months earlier. So this project's in a coma. Uh, politically induced coma and, and um, shows the again the the importance of not just stakeholder support but having support at the political leadership level stakeholders were very much on board yeah and again this was a project that went through a competitive process got 25 million dollars in US DOT funding um, for the initial work and then eventually the city decided they didn't want to do it so they um, gave the money up yeah, pretty unfortunate, um, I think, for their future prospects at FTA. Um, Cincinnati, um, kind of the best of times and the worst of times. They have this project planned to go from their downtown waterfront, where the stadium is, um, um, where there's some museums and other public uh, venues and activities. The Underground Railroad Museum is there. Very cool waterfront redevelopment through the downtown core to this amazing district called Over the Rhine that is this huge collection of historic buildings that are either totally vacant or vacant many of them on the upper floors uh, with some kind of use on the ground floor. Um, the community, there's been huge controversy about this project. Um, they, they've, they've, uh, it's been like the, you know, the seven labors of Hercules for them to get this project done. They had a crazy uh, political fight uh, at the city level, uh, an unlikely alliance of the Libertarian Party and the NAACP chose to, yeah, that talk about strange bedfellows, uh, got together and opposed the project. They're, they have a partisan city council. The Republican city council members decided they didn't like the project. They fought that out. They got to yes at the city council level. Uh, they got $50 million from the state, and then they got a new governor. Uh, governor Kasich, one of this wave of new Republican governors who want to give all the money back to the feds, and he said, no thank you, we're not going to give you any money and we're going to try to make the feds take the money back that they've allocated to you. Uh, they apparently have soldiered through all that, through all that controversy, and now are going to go ahead and build a phase of the project with federal and local money, no help from the state, but no permission needed from the state. Um, and the reason that it's going forward, and the, the, the lesson of Cincinnati is not just that streetcar projects are great and sometimes leadership can get them done, but community support. The people in this neighborhood and over the Rhine, uh, the, the community development corporations, the property owners, the civic activists there are the ones that have 
battle after battle um, push this project forward. So you got to have developer support, political support, and community support to get projects done, not just streetcar projects. But um, in this case, I think the, the happy ending is going to be that um, the Cincinnati activists who have um, believed in this all along as, as the uh, tonic for over the Rhine will have succeeded. Yeah, so, this, is a, this is a governor who yeah. gave up several hundred million dollars of high-speed rail money, yeah. told the federal government to take that back and give it to somebody else. This particular project, they have an independent rating uh, approach for transportation projects in the state of Ohio, and then that's the way the state allocates money. This project was the number one rated transportation project in the state. Uh, they needed to cut $50 million out of the state transportation budget, and the governor wiped out the number one project and took all $50 million from that project. Yeah. So, and then the community's fighting again to restore some funding, make do with local funding, get started with something, and then uh, try to move it forward. Yeah, and that is really one of the lessons is, you know, remember Atlanta again, they sat around for 10 years with an unrealistic first phase. Some of these other first phases have gone through some battles and lived or died, but the ones like Portland, uh, this is the opening day of service in Portland, this is my little nephew uh, waiting at the train. Um, um, he's a little taller now and he's got more trains to wave at. And the reason he's got more trains to wave at is the Portland system has been expanded five times since this photo was taken 10 years ago. He lives in Seattle, he can ride the South Lake Union streetcar and he'll soon be able to ride the First Hill streetcar and other pieces of that network. So, you know, creeping incrementalism works in this and many other things. If you can get the first few miles on the ground, then people will see, oh, I understand now why we have light rail and streetcars. Oh, I understand that people will ride this differently than I might ride the bus to work. So I'm a big believer in uh, that kind of creeping, incre cre creeping incrementalism. Obviously plan well, get the first project in and make it a success, but above all, try something and, and get it going. So that philosophy is animating a lot of what's going on in these other cities around the country, and I think probably half of those dots on the map will turn into projects. And with that, uh, let's take it from there into discussion and, and questions that you have. And as Steve said, we can go into greater detail on, on a lot of those projects. So. Well, let me just throw out one more thing. One of the other projects that we're working on uh, right now is we're the program managers in the District of Columbia uh, who has a mega system plan for light rail. And, and again, you look at Washington, D.C., and they have the best transit system in America in terms of the rail system, the metro system. Um, but these things fill in the gaps. Yeah. yeah. Make the connections, take people where they want to go, uh, places where you're not going to put light rail or subways or heavy rail, uh, great circulators. Uh, a, a lot of the other ones around the country connecting downtowns, connecting medical centers, uh, connecting universities, uh, creating new retail shopping districts, uh, office districts, like we're talking about Amazon and other places here. So uh, it, it's a whole different mindset when you get into the, to the streetcar system. And the current administration, I think, really gets it for the, for the first time in our uh, that at least recent history of the past 40 years or so, uh, there's a big partnership between U.S. Department of Transportation, Housing and Urban Development, um, and EPA. Uh, and they're looking to pool money, pool programs for things like urban circulators, uh, you know, connecting neighborhoods uh, into the bigger system. So, there's some opportunities. Uh, you know, there's a lot going on in the in the federal transportation program right now uh, that's pretty ugly. Uh, federal transit funds in 2011 uh, were cut 30 percent from 2010, and it's likely to be some bigger cuts on the on the transit side uh, 2012 and beyond. But a lot of places are looking at streetcars. There's kind of a history here. Just real quickly, a um, you know, number of years ago, go back to the 70s, everybody had to have a heavy rail system. You know, 
So you've got the Barts and the Miamis and the Atlantas, you know, sort of a mimic of the Chicago and New York subway kinds of systems. Well, after a few years, there was a few of those things done, and the next wave was light rail. Okay, well, we can't put subways in these big heavy rail. We don't need that capacity everywhere. So there's a whole big wave of light rail systems going on everywhere. Uh, okay, we've done a lot of that stuff. Those things are really expensive. Uh, you know, we're in the billions of dollars for major light rail programs. How about taking a look at something that's more doable within a wider variety of communities, has wider applications, uh, also though good, strong economic development tools, and streetcar is really in a tremendous renaissance in the, in the U.S. right now. Um, you saw that map. I don't know how many cities are on that map. No, Forty, probably. Forty cities. Yeah. Uh, some kind of planning, design, or implementation of streetcars around the U.S. right now. So, some great opportunities and great opportunities, I think, for Houston. And uh, you know, I think you guys are right at the top of the list where folks have been talking about things now in Washington and in the super neighborhood. Um, I think there's some great applications there. Charlie was talking about, it's, uh, it's all about building coalitions, uh, getting the private sector involved, getting the neighborhoods involved. Uh, a, a lot of these projects are being developed and pushed by non-traditional uh, transit agencies. You know, it's not always Kurt and the metros that are out there saying, you know, we've got to do these streetcars. It's the, it's the cities, it's the neighborhoods, it's the economic de development authorities bringing these uh, integrated streetcar programs that, that bring such a wide variety of benefits to the community. So that's just a lot of the stuff that's going on right now. Uh, and as Charlie said, open it up for questions, discussion, more detail about any of these other things going on. I think our, one of our challenges in, in our specific corridor is that the corridor is pretty well served by bus. Uh, there are a number of routes that actually run on the main corridor. There are cross routes. Uh, but, and there are a significant number of riders, but it's just not convenient enough in terms of the timing for to, to be attractive, to, to really attract riders, and uh, who just aren't in the situation where they need to take the bus. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about frequency of service and, and how, uh, you know, how streetcars can accomplish that when they're running in a lane with traffic. Well, yeah, those are good questions. Um, I, I think frequency of service needs to be down around 10 minutes. Portland's at 12 now. Um, you know, some people start out at 15 because that's what they can afford. Um, I, I think a big part of what we've learned with streetcar projects is is that there's a lot of of new ridership out there that maybe can't be captured by the models, but is is there? It's latent, um, and even if you have good bus service in the corridor or that occupies part of the corridor, it doesn't mean that that that's absorbed all the potential transit demand in that corridor. You know, the the Portland streetcar uh, overlaps with some bus lines for portions of its alignment. Those bus lines haven't dropped any in ridership, and the streetcar is carrying 12,000 people a day. Those are new riders. The Tacoma streetcar replaced an equivalent free bus shuttle. So same headways, same price, um, same route, 10 times the ridership. Um, so part is that the rail factor, you know, the certainty of, of where it goes, uh, the cool, whatever coolness, you know, is perceived to trains versus buses. But for whatever set of reasons, people will, will ride a train that don't ride a bus every day. Well, the specific example is Metro Rail here. We did the surveys uh, uh, a year after Metro Rail opened, and the results were that 40% of the people who were on the train had never ridden a bus in Houston. Uh, so there's a whole new market. And, and, and it, it, it does create its own kind of trips. You know, Actually, metro rail serves a lot like a streetcar. You know, it doesn't go real fast in some places, but uh, before metro rail, people would never get in their car in the medical center, drive downtown for lunch, find a place to park, have lunch, you know, 
get back in their car, drive back, and park in the medical center. But now it, you can do those kind of trips because you, you have a fixed rail line running at a reasonable frequency. So there's some there's some great opportunities for uh, uh, that, that kind of thing. And I think you, you get that induced ridership, creates a lot of trips. And then the other big difference is on the economic de development side. Um, private sector is not going to be too excited about investing along a bus line somewhere. You know, I know those guys are going to move it. As soon as I build my building, Kurt's going to cut that bus route out and, <laughs> and we're not going to have service here anymore. And then what's going to happen to my property here? You know? So now you, I mean, you put that track, even if you put them in the street, uh, developers will come. Yeah, and you're really supporting that urban lifestyle. So that's why the, the planning, the land use planning, economic development planning piece of it is pretty critical. So so what is the plan for your or any other corridor in terms of how much redevelopment property is there? Who are the players, whether it's redevelopment agencies or private owners that are prepared to build different stuff than they can build today because the streetcar will be hit there. And that upside, as I mentioned, in Seattle, it was it was almost all real estate upside. There wasn't much transportation reason for the project. You know, there's a balance there, I think, in any project. Of, there should be a reasonable amount of existing ridership in the corridor, and there should be a reasonable amount of development potential. Uh, uh, and, you know, that's the art of this, is trying to compose a project that does enough of both. I think, you know, and, and then like you're saying, to, to have a plan for the neighborhood out there. What, what do you want the neighborhood to be? Do you want it to redevelop, not redevelop? And then what can a streetcar do to uh, make that vision happen? We've already seen a great deal of residential redevelopment. Mm -hmm. And it would happen, it happens that that development has occurred outside of the area that would be served by Metro Rail if the rail went where the uh, intercating study said it should go. Right. So we're still dealing with a lot of residential development that would not be served. Yeah. Yes. Um, for the two areas that you talked about in Portland and Seattle were essentially vacant land and kind of underutilized and then the expansive growth that came with that, did they monitor the housing in terms of distribution for different yeah. Sort of subsidies, that yeah. Kind of thing. That's an important issue, not just for streetcars, but but you know the, you can easily use a you can have a transit project gentrify a neighborhood, and make it infeasible for you know a broad spectrum of people to live there, and so again, just as Steve said, you got to have a land use plan for the place that says what do we want this neighborhood to be from a design standpoint? How much more density? You know, where's the parks and retail going to be? You know, so you need to have that thought through, but then. Well, well and then our challenge here in Houston is, yeah. and then how are we going to keep it that we'll way? Keep it that way without zoning. <laughs> yeah, right. um, but then, then from an economic standpoint, who do we want to have live here, and how do we make that happen? And I would say Portland has been partially successful with that, in part because they had a single developer for 40 acres of that property in the Pearl District, and also a similar big chunk in the South Waterfront. And they executed a development agreement with that developer that said, we'll do this, you do that. And one of the things that the developer was committed to do was have 25% of the housing be 30%, 60%, 80% medium family income housing. There's this broad spectrum of affordable housing in the neighborhood because they signed a contract and made it happen. So that's the tools that they had to use. But if you do nothing and build a successful project, you will probably gentrify the neighborhood if the real estate market is you know, moving at all. Um, if you share some of the economics, like a typical cost per mile to construct, and, and like the federal government gets involved, um, what kind of percentage they typically come up with, yeah. and also fares, are these often free, or what, what's being charged? Cost, cost per mile is these days we're seeing, you know, cost estimates of 20 to 25 million per track mile. Um, if it's double track, maybe 40 mil 35 to $40 million. So sometimes it's single track loop, sometimes it's double track. Uh, there's some, you know, some cost factors in each, each direction. But you know, uh, not, not an inexpensive project. The typical starter project is somewhere between you know, 60 and $100 million, and this goes two or three miles. Um, uh, 
typical fair structure, I don't know if there is any such thing as a typical, they're all over the map. Some of them are free, some of them are integrated well with the fair structure of the transit system that they're operating in. Um, uh, federal government um, has been providing these capital grants through Tiger and Urban Circulator grants. Generally, uh, like New Start's 50% or less of the capital is coming from the federal government, even in those cases. Um, so the local, uh, whoops, I oh, lost our signal, but we don't need it. Um, uh, the local uh, local funding is you know is critical, and that's again why real estate development turns out to be pretty important because those folks have ended up paying a pretty substantial cost of the projects through assessment districts and tax increment and those kinds of tools. And I don't think I bet Steve doesn't think the federal government's going to get to be any better than a 50 percent partner either. I think I think that's as good as we can hope for in the near future. Yeah, and again, on these, this type of project, you know, there's quite a few of them out there, and uh, federal government's interested in funding them, but they would rather spend a, the same amount of money in ten places rather than in one or two places. So, yeah. so they're, they're, they're going to be 25 percent, up to 50 percent uh, of the capital cost. But they are very, I mean, Peter Rogoff, the FTA administrator, and Ray LaHood, the Secretary of Transportation, have been talking about this a lot. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever heard a Secretary of Transportation talk about streetcars before this one, and he talks about them all the time. Uh, and Peter Rogoff has devoted a lot of time and, and interest in this, and, they, and he has said, we believe in these projects, we understand that they're, they're uh, economic development tools, and that's great. We also want them to be effective transit projects, so that's that balance I was talking about. They have to be, um, they have to pass the, the straight face test as a good transit investment, and have these local economic benefits that cause mayors and, and community groups to want them. We never had a president talk about transit in State of the Union address. Yeah, right. That was the first two. Yeah, we, like, we like this kind of talk. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot of Republicans we have to deal with. <laughs> the House is pretty tough right yeah, now. It is. Yes. Are the density requirements and things like that similar to light rail, or mm. can it decrease more? Uh, yeah, good question. Of, of bus lines? Yeah, good question. I think the density does not have to be what it is on light rail. I think if you get, you know, 20, 25 units an acre uh, density in the new development, uh, and you can cover a reasonable amount of, of sites along the line with that kind of new development, uh, that's enough. Uh, to produce, you know, reasonable ridership, because again, you're trying to get to five, ten thousand riders a day, probably on one of these projects. You don't have to have you know, thirty-story towers to to drive that. I don't think, you know, single-family neighborhoods and you know, two-story main streets probably aren't enough. It has to be more than that. But again, twenty, twenty-five units an acre three-story, four-story, five-story buildings. Charlie, can you talk a little bit about the differences between station spacing and even station design compared mm, to like Yeah, good point, good points. Um, station spacing is typically quite a bit closer together than what you'd see on light rail, um, you know, 700, 800 feet apart. Uh, one, it is a slow speed, convenient <coughs> circulator. Um, so you trade off speed for convenience. Um, sometimes we call these projects pedestrian accelerators. You know, so so uh, you know, I'm walking down the street. Here comes the streetcar. It's I got to get to this meeting. I'm going to jump on the streetcar and ride half a mile. It's that kind of service. So what does that stop need to be? A curb extension and a small shelter, because not that many people are waiting at any given stop because there are a lot of them and they're not waiting that long. Uh, we probably undersized the shelters on the Portland streetcar line. We just bought real standard small bus shelters. Uh, we put in the next bus system that tells people, you know, when the next vehicle is coming. That helps a lot with a circulator that, hey, I've got time to get a cup of coffee and I can go get on the streetcar in six minutes and get downtown. Yes. Do you use signal priority? We did. Um, yeah, that's right. Somebody asked about traffic earlier and I skipped over that. Um, we didn't use it enough. And I think that's a policy, you know, debate that needs to be had is, wait, we're going to have 10,000 people on this street that are leaving their cars at home. Can't we give them the first class service? 
you know, get them through those intersections. Use Opticom or some other technology that allows them to get the green or hold the green. Um, you know, make the if it's a if it's a uh, four-lane street and the streetcar is operating in the right travel lane and you're having trouble with cars queuing up at the intersection blocking the streetcar from getting to the, the the stop, the near side curb extension, then make that lane right turn only except for streetcar. Dump the cars out of that lane. Those are, you know, we haven't done that in Portland. We should. If you've ridden our system, you'll notice on 10th and 11th avenues that'll happen to the streetcar. It'll get caught behind three or four cars and can't get to the stop and open its doors. But they're, they're three-lane, one-way streets. They should convert those to <coughs> right turn only and get those cars out of the way. So, you know, again, a fairly simple technology like Nextbus or Opticom can make these vehicles, you know, go faster in traffic. And why not? They're doing uh, outsized duty and moving people around compared to the, the cars that would be there. But that's a political and policy discussion that isn't easy kind of an idea of the range of projects that's out there. Right now, Charlie is project manager on two projects. Uh, one is downtown Los Angeles, and the other is Kansas City. Yeah. So that yeah. gives you a little bit yeah. of the bracket. Pretty, of the, of pretty the kind big of range. Yeah, the Kansas, <laughs> the downtown LA project is going to be 15,000 riders the day it opens. It's just right down Broadway from Staples Center to, to Union Station. It's just going to they're just going to blow the doors off there. The old theater district, yeah. which really needs some revitalization there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, we're working in Providence, pretty modest city with uh, not a lot of growth, and yet they're going to probably try to make a streetcar project happen. So yeah, pretty, gonna happen. pretty broad spectrum of, of cities doing this. Have you, have you seen the hybrid type of technology in Providence? Yeah, did you go to see that? Did you see the Kinkasherio battery-operated vehicle? I wasn't sure if you were there for well, that. Only video demonstrations. Yeah, I seen yeah. Some, of our, some of our staff did go see that vehicle that was in Dallas. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting development. And if it works, great, because it might reduce the capital cost even further if we don't have to put up a catenary system. This is what he's talking about is there's a hybrid uh, vehicle design now being marketed by a couple of the manufacturers that uses either batteries or capacitors to store power and allow the vehicle to run without an overhead wire for some of some of its distance or maybe just charge at each end of the route. So then you eliminate the overhead catenary system, the cost of that. It also usually at the planning stage is something people worry about is that it can be ugly to have the overhead wires down the street. In some places like crossing Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., you're never going to get overhead wires on that street, so you better have a technical solution to that. Yeah, that's part of the work we're doing in D.C. There's, yeah. you know, if you go across the mall or Pennsylvania Avenue, you're not going to be stringing trolley wires up there, so yeah. we've got to come up with some different solutions. Yeah. So that's, that's kind several of places are looking at that technology. Can you have any sense of the development time that it took to produce that first prototype and, and what the speed of Oh, Kinky uh, Sherio says they're ready to sell you one. You know, I mean, they, they've got one, they're ready to... How fast they're going to go from, you know, five miles to, you know, bigger. Oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah. with, the, with the distances the distances, on distances, yeah, good question. Yeah. Boy, I don't know. I mean, for at, at least 15 years, people have been telling me next year we're going to have a fuel cell that can do this kind of thing. <laughs> you know, we finally got a little bit of buses and, you know, and now it's you know, a streetcar kind of thing here, so it's been pretty slow over the past few years. Yeah, yeah. but it, it is, I mean, I think it is a uh, promising new development. I, mean, I worked years ago on the on the little one down in Galveston, you know, streetcar down there that ended up, you know, no wires, so it had to be a diesel electric kind of thing, you know, on that one, but I think, I mean, we're way past that now with some of the capacitor and the, and, and the battery technology. Is there ever going to be one that, uh, you know, like you said, will do 10 or 20 miles? Uh, I don't know, but there's some pretty slick charging technologies. Some of these things now where you know, they don't have a overhead wire, but they come into the station with an overhead contact, and essentially just the time that they're waiting to pick up people, they can charge. Uh, pretty quick charging systems. So. Well, Chandra, thank you so much for setting this up. I'm glad we could have this discussion. And get back to us if you have any other questions. Uh, we are working on these kind of projects in a lot of different situations, so we've, we've picked up a little as we've gone along.
thank you, and definitely thanks to HDR for allowing you to come in today and speak to us. Mary and I will be working as a team on the brown bag series as it continues, and if anyone here from an agency or consulting firm would be interested in coming to speak with us, uh, feel free to click on flyer for me about that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.